My name is Bill LePage. I'm Australian. And I first heard of Maya Baba when I was in the middle of my university course studying psychology. That was in 1947. I received, through my contact with the Sufi society, the discourses of Baba's. And although I knew nothing about Maya Baba, I knew nothing of such things as God, man, avatar, perfect master. I was not interested in religions. I was only interested in what life was about. I was immediately struck very deeply with the, the authority of his right. It was so obvious that whoever Maya Baba was, he was one who knew what he was saying. He knew what he was... Uh, uh, he knew every aspect of life and, uh, and could answer and did not avoid answering any question that, are, that, that naturally arose to one's mind. So I continue to read Baba's discourses. And a little time later, I met Francis Brabazon. Stop for a minute. As I said, I met Francis approximately a year after coming into contact with Baba. I continued to read his discourses. As the years passed, I became convinced that I wanted to work with Francis, with Francis Brabazon. I wanted to assist him in his efforts to spread Baba's message in Australia. I felt, as I, can, as I felt very deeply, that Francis was the only one, only one in Australia worth working with. So, when I, was given, when I was offered a position which meant a change to Sydney where Francis lived, I lived in Melbourne at that time, which is in the southern part of Australia. And I was given the opportunity of moving to Sydney and I grabbed it with both hands, provided they moved me free of cost. So, I, first of all, I got to Sydney where Francis lived and worked free of cost, and at the same time, for the first time in my life, I had some money which came from the sale of the house I'd built in Melbourne. Sale of the house I'd built in Melbourne. Um, uh, the day I arrived, the day I arrived in Sydney was the day that we received word from Barber that those who love Baba, men who love Baba, could come to see him. So, through a chain of events, I, I had my, you could say, my deepest wish to see Baba. Uh, if, I, if I had stayed in Melbourne, I wouldn't have had the money to get to see him. But by moving to Sydney and being able to sell my house, uh, I had the sufficient funds. So, I went with Francis and one other young Australian to see Barbara in 1954. We, the first contact I had with Barbara was at a mass Darshan program. Darshan means literally sight of. In other words, it was, um, it was seeing the master. Bowing down to him, offering one's love and being blessed by him. Um, Baba came onto the platform and we Westerners were seated in a semicircle behind Baba's chair. And just shortly after Baba arrived, he turned round. And I don't know about the others, the other Westerners, but I know, I can only tell you that in the moment he met my eyes, I experienced what you might call an electric shock. My contact was such that I, that I felt a shock in, in meeting his eyes. Um, 
Okay, so my contact, that was my first contact with Barber, and then it continued in the sense, of course, as usual with Barber, one had an interview with Barber in which he said, well, are you prepared to obey me? And I said, yes. He said, are you prepared to go down through the streets of uh, Amanaga naked? And I said, yes. And he asked various other things, which I've, I've forgotten now. Uh, it was so natural, one was never conscious that he was silent. One wasn't aware that, that he didn't speak. He, he, seemed, he seemed so much completely with you in, in, in a way that no other person ever was with one. In looking at you, he saw right into you and you knew that he knew you as no other person would know you. And yet at the same time, he was, he was looking beyond one. He was, he was, one couldn't help but think he was like one certainly occupied with the universe, not concerned with that which was immediately in front of one, in front of him. Um, and he was, and as I said, he was so natural. In the same way he would respond uh, to perhaps thoughts of one. For example, there was one occasion very soon after one of the first meetings when Barb was giving a discourse and he got a certain look in, in the face. You know, one of the, you know how you like a, a photograph of Barber? Well, there was a, he, he just happened to look in a certain way and his eyes looked a certain way and I thought to myself, oh, you know, Barber, stay like that. That's so nice. I'd like to just look at, at you like that. And immediately he said, he stopped the discourse. For example, there was one occasion very soon after one of the first meetings when Barb was giving a discourse and he got a certain look in, in the face. You know, one, it's, you know how you like a, a photograph of Barber? Well, there was a, he, he just happened to look in a certain way and his eyes looked a certain way and I thought to myself, oh, you know, Barber, stay like that. That's so nice, I'd like to just look at that you are like that. And immediately he said, he stopped the discourse and said, right, now, now I want all of you to sit quietly for five minutes and just look at me. And he remained in that, that expression that I liked. But I didn't think to myself, well, isn't that amazing? He knew what I was thinking. It seemed to be so natural. Of course he knew. There was no question that he wouldn't know. Uh, so I was there with Barber, with those other Westerners, for something, I think it was approximately three weeks. And Barber told me at that time to spread his message, which, although I had endeavoured to do before that, I renewed my efforts to do so after that. And so my contact with Barber went on. Uh, Barber came to Australia in 1956 and stayed in the house in which we now live, Mayer House. He came in 1958 and stayed in the property that Francis Brabazon found for him in Queensland, that's northern part of Australia, which Barber named Avatar's Abode. Uh, then uh, myself and my family, my wife and three children, uh, went to see Barber at the East-West Gathering in 1962. And then in 1967, Barber called me over to India for 15 days. And he said to me, what has happened in my work in Australia? I said, Barber, so little, virtually nothing. Nothing has happened. I have tried, um, and nothing seems to have, uh, have occurred. No one comes forward. So, so few take an interest in, in hearing about you. And in so many words, I said to Barber, uh, I can't do it. I, I, I don't know what to do. Barber said, I will turn the key. 
it's an expression that he often used to it seemed he used the expression during the years when his his uh, disciples Baba said I will turn the key and it is a fact that the moment I arrived back in Australia from those 15 days with Baba that opportunities came in so often to, to appear on TV uh, have interviews on radio to have interviews with newspaper people and I conducted a number of public meetings including ones at university uh, and and then at the same time the young people particularly the young people like yourselves um, came started to come to my house and inquire about Barbara and started to take an interest in in attending um, readings regular weekly readings and so the work spread and and developed and now in Australia at the present moment, although so many people know of Baba, know his name and have read something of Baba, we have perhaps an active group of some 60 or 70 people who uh, work together to spread Baba's message and, uh, of truth more in Australia and who endeavour to entertain Baba at the time of his of his anniversary, at the anniversary of his visit to Australia, or visits to Australia in fifty six and nineteen fifty eight, for example, all right, for example, in nineteen uh, in this year, Barber came to Australia in fifty eight in the beginning of June. So this year. As always, we have three-day celebration of that, of that occasion. And we all meet at, on this property which he named Avatar's Abode. And this year, our program consisted of, of a, one evening of short plays about Barber's, more about Barber's teaching and... and um, uh, aspects of Barber in life, in general living. And then the next evening was devoted solely to plays on Barber's life. The first part of the evening was Barber's life up to 1948, and then the second half was Barber's new life. And the, the scripts were written by the young Barber people, uh, songs were written about by the barber people. They were sung by barber people. Slideshows were formed, were um, you know made, etc. It was acted and directed by the barber people. Barber people. They were sung by barber people. Slideshows were formed, were um, you know made, etc. It was acted and directed by the barber people. Um, yeah, the, the, that, the life of Barber, perhaps I could tell you a bit about that? There was one occasion when I was, when Eric was not with Barber, and I was before Barber, and this was in 1962 during the, the, the East West Gathering. And Barber to somebody alongside him gestured like this. And I was bewildered at first. I wondered exactly what Barber meant. And all of a sudden I realized that he was saying, I come from down under, from Australia. So I said to uh, Barber gestured pointing downwards, and I was perplexed until I suddenly, it flashed into my mind, oh, Barba means down under. And I said to the person next to Barba, I come from Australia. Barba smiled. It was one of the few occasions when I was able to interpret <laughs> Barba's gestures. 
Um, but I, I have, I have, of course, during the the period in '67 when I lived at Mayrazad with the Mundley, I was with Baba uh, each day, just sitting with the with Baba's Mundley and listening to the to the work sessions that occurred at that time. Baba would have letters read to him. He would have. Uh, uh, work reports read to him of, uh, from this centre or that centre, uh, queries that people would raise with him, and he would listen so patiently. Some, uh, at times, I felt myself that they were not. How could how could God man um, bear to listen to this to the particular thing? But Baba was the sol the ocean of compassion. And he'd listen. And he would obviously appreciate the love that inspired the letter or the booklet or what have you, or the act or the activity. I myself was not impressed, but but Barbara was happy. <laughs> so what did that matter? Um, When I first, when I first, in first meeting Barber, it certainly confirmed the feeling that I had that Barber was what he stated, God in human form. I had no proof of that. I would, I would naturally, I would have to be God myself to know that he is God. But I, cer I certainly believe that, and in meeting him and being with him, strengthened that, that conviction. He was so extraordinary in himself that, I couldn't, that one couldn't imagine him to be other than what he stated. I had... I'm not. I've had no visions of Barber. I'm not. I'm not interested in such things. I. I'm simply. I try and do something that, that I can. Barber told me to spread his message, and I do the best I can to do that. Uh, so I'm. You. It is no good asking me what deep experiences I've had and all visions I've had of Barbara. I know nothing of, of, of that sort of thing. All I know is that, that Barbara, when Barbara says that he loves us more than we can ever love ourselves, it is true. He is the Divine Beloved. He does love one. And he will always be there. He will always, always respond. There is nothing surer than the fact that he is always with one. But one has to be with Baba. One can so easily get lost in doing in other activities, in in a being absorbed with oneself, and forget the divine beloved who is always there. I believe that 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 Baba said only two things, two main things to us, love God and fulfill one's responsibilities. Carry out whatever Baba gives one to carry out. Do whatever is in front of one. Don't, don't try to be other than what one is and don't try to be uh, not there where Baba has placed one. Be happy with, with where Barbara's placed one and with what Barbara's given one to do. That is where Barbara is, not elsewhere. He is, he is within one and with one, always. <laughs> Just stop. <laughs> That's quite enough. <laughs> You asked me about Barber's visit again, or visits again to Australia. I can recall that in driving him, he um, there were general conversation going on in the car. I had Barber seated alongside me, and 
uh, three of the Munley in the back seat. And on one occasion I remember thinking a question occurring to me while I was driving Barber. And then I thought to myself, well, as I, I never asked, I, I never asked Barber questions. Except once I did ask Barber, would he come to Australia? And he turned quite sharply to me and said, don't you think I'm not already there? You asked me about Barber's visit again, or visits again to Australia. I can recall that in driving him, he, um, there were general conversation going on in the car. I had Barber seated alongside me, and uh, three of the Munley in the back seat. And on one occasion, I remember thinking a question occurring to me while I was driving Barber. And then I thought to myself, well, as I, I never asked, I, I never asked Barber questions. Except once, I did ask Barber, would he come to Australia? And he turned quite sharply to me and said, don't you think I'm not already there? So after that, I decided I wouldn't ask any questions. That was my, uh, that was the first, my first interview I ever had with Barber. I asked him that. Uh, and I thought of this question and I thought to myself, well, that's all right. I'll think about that later. And Barber promptly answered it. Uh, the, the driving was very natural. One felt very much at home. Barber, uh, reminded me on one occasion how they used to keep the driver awake when they drove in India on the, the must tours. How Barber would, um, would ask the driver, how far to the next town? And then in a short distance, how far now? So the driver had to be mentally alert, keep his wits about him, thinking of how far he travelled and how far to the next town, and so on. Um, I felt very happy driving him. It was, it, it was, one didn't feel, one never felt uh, uncomfortable with Barber. One felt, one, one certainly felt alert as one never felt at any other time, more alert than one felt normally, but also very natural. Barber put one at one's ease. I remember, I remember a little story, didn't, not with myself, but with two Australian women when they first met Barber, and one was a very homely type of person. And, uh, and she was accustomed to homely language, shall I say. And the first thing Barbara said to her was, as soon as she came into the room, and she was very nervous, very nervous about meeting Barbara, and Barbara promptly said to her, have you had your grub this morning? And grub is a, is a word in Australian slang for food, for breakfast, in other words. Have you had your grub? And immediately she felt at home. I, oh, he's one of my mob. <laughs> In other words, Barber was the most homely when, when the requirement was there. And he was the most scholarly and the most erudite when the professors were there. And when Barber was with professors, he was the most erudite. He was all things to all men. I'm sorry, I don't know what else to say now. I, I, I've, I've said that bit. <laughs> uh, following a say. journey. Begin. Francis did a journey with Baba in the Andhra district of India. And he then wrote a poem called Journey with God. And later, Barber referred to that book, saying, you wrote a book, Journey with God. Now write a book, Stay with God. And that's how Stay with God was the beginning. Barber said, this book, gives life 
to God speaks. Uh, God speaks is Barber's principal statement. Barber didn't write books, he just made statements. He made statements in response to people like ourselves who loved him and although the truth is not in words, at the same time because we're human we would, we would ask Barber to say something. So Barber out of compassion would say something. And those statements became the books that are published. Yes. I couldn't tell you, I wasn't there at the time. No, I'm sorry. Those, those discourses were principally given in the 1930s. Uh, and they principally came about, as far as I know, because of um, the Maya Barber Journal, which was published, and Barber agreed to give a discourse for each journal issue. I think it was something like that. And there were also some discourses which he had uh, and were recorded and he'd given to the boys during a school that he had in India in the, in the late 1920s. Yes, many times. No, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't recall enough to be accurate. And I like being accurate. I don't like saying anything about Barber which may mislead anyone. Uh, he gave many discourses, very beautiful discourses, in, during the 1954 visit. And, uh, and they were recorded, they have been recorded mainly by Charles Purdom in his account of that 1954 men's gathering. He was, he, he was perfect in every respect, no matter what quality, human quality one could think of, he, he expressed the perfection of that quality. If one, if one thought of, of many qualities like, like courage, like steadfastness, like uh, trustworthiness, he was, he was the perfection of that, of that quality. He was everything that one, one would ever, ever dream of, of being as a man. He, in other words, he became, from a human point of view, a, an ideal that was thoroughly intelligible to anyone, no matter what their circumstance or station in life was. That's why I say, with the poor, he was the poorest of the poor, and with the rich, he was the richest. With the, with the homely ones, he was most homely. He was so natural. And with the, and with the, the, the ones who uh, were very conscious of their learning, he was the most learned. So much so that they become, became tongue-tied. I've heard of instances where the professors have come to Barber to sort of ask all sorts of profound questions and have just gone away in tears, unable to express a single word. So overwhelming was his presence. If, if anything else, the thing that one could say about Barber was that he, that he was so overwhelming. There was nothing, there was no other being but Barber. In being with, with Barber, one was only conscious of him. He was, so, he was so full and complete in himself. So rich and broad and, and deep and everything else. There was no other being that one, there was nothing, no one else to see in, the, in this world. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, there was one occasion when he said at Avatar's abode that he would um, he was going to throw a sweet to each one, and I was seated on one side of the of the room, and Francis was right on the other side, and I had my hands just in, folded in my lap, just like I was just sitting like that, and Barbara was looking towards Francis with a sweet in his hand, and I thought to myself, Ah, he's going to throw the sweet to, to Francis, and he threw. And all of a sudden, the sweet was in my hand. He wasn't looking at me. <laughs> I, was, I was quite amazed. <laughs> uh, but uh, but he, he also, he varied. In 1956 in, in Australia, he was, he was far more relaxed and, and he joked more. He, in, giving a, in giving us a discourse, he would, 
he, he did a lot of mi mimicking or miming. Uh, but, uh, but he, he also, he varied. In 1956 in, in Australia, he was, he was far more relaxed and, and he joked more. He, in, giving a, in giving us a discourse, he, would, he, he did a lot of mi mimicking or miming. Uh, in describing people, he would he would suddenly become he looked quite fat in describing a fat person and quite thin in in, in describing a thin person. It was quite it was absolutely amazing. <laughs> he was he was delightful as an actor. Um, and, um, and, and but then in in 1958 when he came, he was much more serious, very serious. And and there were times when one could only just look at him. It, it was just, he, it was as though he was concerned, involved in some work, in a work that we had nothing, I, I, we wouldn't know what it was, but it was something very deep, uh, something of great concern. And he was very remote. And and towards the end of that visit in 1958, he said to us, there would be many who would not see him again in this life. It was, it was a very solemn occasion. There was much, but then there were lighter moments. For example, when I was walking with him under the veranda of the barber house at Avatar's abode, and he pointed to some fruit on the tree, and I said, pawpaw, which is the Australian word for the fruit papaya. Barber looked quite startled, sort of poor, 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 and then and then one of the Mundley said papaya. Barber was very amused at the at this Australian word, which is what we use for that fruit. Yes, his face constantly changed. Uh, it was as though there were a thousand moods passing constantly across his face. He was never still. He was the most still of all beings. He was the ocean of stillness, and yet at the same time it was constantly moving. Very beautiful. His, the eyes constantly changed, reflected so many things. Were you ever aware of him working on a particular fault he might have or something? There were occasions. He, picked, he saw me eating one time. This is a little personal thing. He, uh, he saw me eating and gestured, what is wrong? And I said I had some teeth missing at the bottom, um, back teeth. He promptly said, uh, get, a false, get false teeth. So I used to say proudly to people, God told me to get my teeth. <laughs> 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 um, but also at the, at the same time what he said and I can't remember his, the exact words but the point was that it suddenly, it suddenly I suddenly realised that I should slow down I should take time in, in doing whatever I was doing not just eating in other words the eating was only the excuse that he used in order to to Reveal something of myself and the and the changes that should take place. It had did have a quite a, I think I can say quite a profound effect. That little instance. That was a very beautiful time when he sat in the kitchen of Mayer House in Sydney. He sat and there were about nine of us. Francis and I cooked fish for all of us and Barbara. Barber cut off cheese from a great lump of cheese he had on the table and, and a piece of bread and butter and slapped it on each plate with fish that we'd cooked. And we all sat in the kitchen and ate with him. At the same time, what he said, and I can't remember his, the exact word, but the point was that it suddenly, it suddenly, I suddenly realised that I should slow down. I should take time in in doing whatever I was doing, not just eating. In other words, the eating was only the excuse that he used in order to, to reveal something of myself and the, and the changes that should take place.
it had did have a quite a I think I can say quite a profound effect. That little instance. That was a very beautiful time when he sat in the kitchen of Mayer House in Sydney. He sat and there were about nine of us. Francis and I cooked fish for all of us and Barber Barber cut off cheese from a great lump of cheese he had on the table and, and a piece of bread and butter and slapped it on each plate with fish that we'd cooked and we all sat in the kitchen and ate with him. And the sun was coming through the window. It was a very, a very lovely moment. That's enough for the moment. <laughs> Baba came to Australia first time. In the, on, he landed on the 9th of August, 1956. And that was some four months before his, fir his second car accident, which took place in India. All right, that was in December 1956. So I had seen Barber walking in 1954 and also in 1956. I remember particularly you have little personal memories, you know, particular memories of Barber that stand out. And I remember Barber pacing up and down the the part of the lounge in the airport while we were waiting for him. I think it was when, I, when he went to Melbourne. I just can't remember exactly, but I remember him walking up and down. I, I remember thinking what, how like a caged lion or, or um, a, a, a panther or something of that sort. Most beautiful gliding movement, but so, but so powerful. There was so much so much power completely in that, in, expressed in that walk. Then, of course, in 58, he walked, but very slowly. My, my first impression, that was the first time I'd seen him since his car accident, and he, he was walking very slowly across the tarmac uh, at the airport, steadied by Erich. Erich was walking alongside him, and he walked very slowly. And there was, immediately there was this deep impression of suffering. I wrote the, the little account I have written of Barber's visit which, in 1958, which incidentally will be printed in the Awakener. And I remember Barber pacing up and down the, the part of the lounge in the airport while we were waiting for him I think it was when I when he went to Melbourne. I just can't remember exactly, but I remember him walking up and down. I, I remember thinking, what, how like a caged lion or or um, a, a, a panther or something of that sort. Most beautiful gliding movement, but so but so powerful. There was so much so much power completely in that in expressed in that walk. Then, of course, in 58, he walked, but very slowly. My, my first impression, that was the first time I'd seen him since his car accident, and he crossed the tarmac at the airport, steadied by Erich. Erich was walking alongside him, and he walked very slowly. And there was, immediately there was this deep impression of suffering. I wrote... The, the little account I have written of Barber's visit, which in 1958, which incidentally will be printed in the Awakener. I've given it to Ph Phyllis Frederick. To, she asked for it to be printed, so I agreed. And uh, and as I say in that, it is it was suffering that was beyond comprehension. So so immense was it. It was the impression that one gained. Uh, and then, of course, I saw him in 1962 and again in 1967. In 1967, he was, again, he was walking but very little. His walking mainly that I saw was mainly two or three times uh, with his hand resting on Francis's arm up and down the Mundley Hall at, at Marazan. The hall, the, the men's Mundley Hall where Barber would meet his men Mundley each day 
and have what I call this work session. When letters were read out to him, reports, uh, uh, new booklets or booklets and so uh, books and so forth were presented to him. It's all for the moment. Have you written any books? I have not written any books. I've written booklets. I've written a number of introductory booklets. I'm quite happy to do that, <laughs> but I'm not a writer. No. Barbara didn't tell me to, to write, so fortunately I didn't have to. Did Barbara ever have you acted those little skits that you made the No. Uh, there was one occasion when I, when Kaka, in 67, Kaka would be asked by Barber to name the Indian boys that were around the ashram. And Kaka, would, who had speech differently, would, ha would give an impossible name. I, I, I wouldn't know what language. And Barber used to be very amused by this response of Kaka's. And then he would have me repeat what Kaka had said. So that was even more amusing because I was even more hopeless. <laughs> No, uh, there was one occasion when I, when Kaka, in 67, Kaka would be asked by Baba to name the Indian boys that were around the ashram. And Kaka would, who had speech differently, would, ha would give an impossible name. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't know what language, and Barber used to be very amused by this response of Karka's, and then he would have me repeat what Karka had said. So that was even more amusing, because I was even more hopeless. <laughs> I first, I, t I mentioned that earlier, I first saw Barber, my first meeting, my first sight of Barber physically, in physical form was his arrival at the Mass Darshan program in 1954. There was a stage, and Barber was seated on the stage, and he glanced round and certainly met my eyes. I think he must, he probably glanced at each one of the Westerners. As I, I mentioned earlier, I can only describe it as similar to what I would imagine electric shock was. I don't... All I can say is it was... There was a shock. Yes, it was a shock, but I... But I I can't say that it, it was a shock of divine love. I know nothing about those things. <laughs> I, I, if if a person says uh, how I am, how am I with Barbara? I, I'm simply a worker for Barbara. I, Barbara, I try and do what I can to spread his message, to tell people about him, and I and I try to, in my own way, to love him as he w would wish us to love him. Oh, there's no, there's no such question. No question. How could one choose anyone else but Barbara? There, there is... No, it's all right. I'm sorry, it's a question. I, no, I'm, I'm, what I mean is that I, ha I, did ha I had read widely, as I, as I mentioned in the beginning, I was very interested in what life was all about. And certainly I read, I had read widely. And I, and I didn't hesitate to, to, to see anyone that sounded interesting. But no one, absolutely no one, touched me as Barber did. No, in reading his discourses and then in, in meeting him. In other words, there was no question that in reading him, he was one who really knew what it was about. He wasn't fumbling. He wasn't pretending. He wasn't saying... ...in meeting him. In other words, there was no question that in reading him, he was one who really knew what it was about. He wasn't fumbling. He wasn't pretending. He wasn't saying... Uh, he wasn't manufacturing something out of his mind, saying, oh yes, this is what it's all about, when it's not.
when he just doesn't know. That is, that is what so many people do. Everyone wants to teach. Everyone wants to say what, what it's all about. But no one's prepared to get down the tin tacks and, and experience it. It's become that and then speak. We're all so keen on being teachers instead of just doing things for each other. J. Barber. J. Barber. Enough? But, I, but, but this goes on. <laughs> you any Don't waste any more film. It's, uh, I'm not saying anything. Any ah, yes. Barber, Barber gave me photographs at times. He always signed whatever I did, the introductory booklets, the, book, the books that I published for him. He signed. Um, he gave me a scarf. Uh, which I always carry with me. One of the okay. Okay. Yes. Um, that's about... Yeah. Yeah. But uh, those, those things, of course one treasures those things, but, one, but in the main it, it is one's in a meeting with Barber, just in the same way People have often said, what was it like to meet Barber? And I say, it is the same as you meeting Barber. What's the difference? You meet Barber in your own hearts. That's where Barber is. And that's the same for myself. There's no difference. You loved meeting Barber, so did I. <laughs> uh, I was with the... The cameraman, we, we did take, as you know, a sh very short film of Barber coming to Australia for the first time in 1956. I was with the cameraman uh, stationed above the tarmac on the, on the uh, first floor level, above the, ta the tarmac, and we, and we had the camera on Barber as he walked from the plane. And you can see that in the film, that beautiful flying walk of barbers into the, into the, the lounge, the uh, terminal building. Then Barber came out after some time after being cleared, of course, by customs. He came out and uh, Barber was settled in the... I had driven up to the door. Barber was settled into the car in which I was driving. Uh, I was nervous at first. I was very conscious of the fact that I was driving Godman. But, uh, but very soon after I started, because Barber had that ability to put one at one's ease, I was not nervous and I felt quite at home. No, his hair was uh, drawn back and hidden in a pigtail underneath his coat. Uh, I remember I did see Barber's hair being combed by Erich one morning. Just, just that. Uh, right, so I drove him to the house which has become known as Mayer House and Beacon Hill, where the other approximately 30 Australian lovers were gathered. He was introduced to each one uh, on arrival, which was at the, the late afternoon of the, fir of, of the 9th of August. But, the, but the, the time with Barber didn't really start until the next morning, the 10th. And the, we, from memory, I think we met all together in Mayer House, in the lounge of Mayer House, which is a big room, 30 feet by 20. Barber said how he had come to see the house that had been built for him and to give his love, to plant the seed of love in, the, in Australia, in, in the country. Um, he then gave, after, after a short time, he then gave interviews and he would give in, and, he, and it was mainly with families so that, that my, Joan, my wife and I were together and the three children. The youngest was only two at that time. And we were with Barber. Uh, Barber asked us 
questions about our health, about ourselves. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember. The, and Barbara played with the children, and the children loved it. It's, it's very much, uh, that was very, very much so. Uh, there weren't very many. There weren't very many of us and very many children, but he seemed to, I know he played with our children. Um, then there, there another occasion there weren't very many of us and very many children but he seemed to I know he played with our children um, then there, there another occasion we had one morning which was a public morning in which Barbara said that he was happy for anyone to come to see him who wished to and we had invited various people. I had done my best to tell everyone that I knew, people at work and so forth, uh, about Barber and, and pressed them to come and see him, which about probably something in the order of 120, 130 people came at that time and were taken into the room where Barber was seated and were given some little piece of fruit or nut by Barber, and in other words, there was simply, excuse me, a very simple greeting between the person and Barber, a moment or two, and that was finished. There wasn't an, it wasn't an interview. It was a meeting. Then, I think this is correct, in the afternoon, Barber suddenly announced that he would take us to a film. And I recall very clearly how Barber came out of the house after a while dressed in a new suit, the first time he'd worn this suit, and how Barber uh, turned round for our benefit, showing us his new suit and how fine he looked in his new suit. It was a very, very lovely moment. And then I drove him into the centre of Sydney, into the, into the main part of Sydney, and we went to a, a picture theatre and there was an amusing little story happened there, which I heard about afterwards. Uh, Barber stood in the middle of the seats. The film had already started. The, the uh, supporting film had started, not the main film, the supporting film. And Barber stood in the middle of the seats and directed where each of us would sit. And apparently somebody in the, behind Barber Barber was between them and the screen, and somebody said, who does he think he is? Jesus Christ. <laughs> An expression meaning somebody who had, who had uh, setting themselves up, you know, directing who, where everyone would sit. <laughs> um, and I, Barber was seated here, and I was just behind him, slightly to the side, and the film was so poor that after a little while, I thought, I'm not going to bother to watch the film. I'll, uh, I'll close my eyes and think of Barber. Just, just, I'd rather do that. And immediately, I did so. Immediately, I closed my eyes. Barber turned round and patted my knee. Uh, uh, nodded, as though to say, I agree. It is a dreadful film. It's not worth watching. <laughs> so, <laughs> so after a while, it, the film was so bad that... Uh, we didn't know, we had no idea, we hadn't seen any films. So immediately I closed my eyes, Barber turned round and patted my knee, uh, uh, nodded, as though to say, I agree, it is a dreadful film, it's not worth watching. <laughs> so, <laughs> so after a while, it, the film was so bad that uh, we didn't know, we had no idea, we hadn't seen any films. We were we were not in the habit of going to films or anywhere, we were too busy preparing for Barber's for Barber's visit, um, to worry about um, the films, and we just simply, uh, Barber just got up and left after a short time. And then I drove him through some of the main streets of Sydney, the shopping, shopping centre, and then home. And I drove him a different way. Where I went one way and I came back another way in a, in a bit of a circle so that he saw more of Sydney. Uh, then other to various homes 
where barber lovers lived and and where they were accommodating other barber lovers who had come to be with barber. Then during that time in Sydney, Barber went to Melbourne and spent something like a day, two half days in Melbourne. I didn't go. Uh, I stayed with the three children who were very young at the time and so that my wife, Jane, could go uh, because her mother lived in Melbourne and she wanted to take her mother to see to meet Barber. So Barber had me stay in the house and he gave me the manuscript at that time of Life at Its Best to read. It hadn't been published at that time, it was still typewritten. And he gave it to me with his own hands and asked me to tell me to read it. It was that at the atmosphere of that room, although Barbara is always there, and I, I, to digress for a moment, I said to Barber many years later that I wanted to make certain changes in that room where he had lived and worked. But I was concerned about changing anything. And he said, you, do, you can do what you like with the room, nothing will destroy my presence in it. And certainly I can recall to this day very vividly uh, the feeling that was in that room when, whilst Barber was there. And during the time when, when I stayed there with the children and Barbara went to Melbourne. Thank you. Do you know if it's true that someone told me that Barbara walked out of the Ten Commandments? Uh, yes, Barbara, Barbara saw only the first part, uh, which I. It, Yes, just um, from my own point of view, I sort of can understand that because the first part was very moving. I found I felt it was I like I liked it myself. I didn't like the second part nearly as much. But I but th that story that Barber the comment that Barber made was very beautiful. In that it was reported in the family letter. Have you read that? Where the old Pharaoh dies, and in dying says the name of Moses which he had banned, which he had said must never be said again in, in the kingdom. And with his own breath, with his dying breath, he broke his own commandment and said it, the name of God and of course went to God. And Baba said how, how that was fact, that's what happened. Very, very, very fine, very touching scene that, very moving. Barber was brought, Francis went to Sydney to meet Barber on his arrival in 1958. Then another Barber lover, John Bruford and myself, drove to Brisbane at 70 miles south of Avatar's abode to collect Barber in two cars, Barber and the Mundley. And we stayed overnight in Brisbane. I had previously scouted through the hotels and established what I thought was the best hotel for Barber. And um, that's where we took him after meeting him at the airport. All right? We drove to the, to the hotel and we stayed there overnight. And in the morning, we arose... I had a, an early morning session with Barber. Barber called me in and spoke about certain aspects of the work. Uh, and then later in the morning, probably about 9 o'clock, 9.30, we set off for Avatar's abode in two cars. John Bruford driving Barber in a new car that he had purchased for the, especially for that purpose. Uh, we arrived at Avatar's abode and Barber greeted the, all the Australians, about 50 Australian lovers who had gathered to, to see Barber. Then we 
we gathered together in a, a meeting hall. We we called it a meeting hall. We hadn't we we ran out of, as it were, time and money to complete the meeting hall. So that it was it was only partially covered in on the sides with Hessian. And as it happened, although it was cleaned land and it's a semi-tropical climate, it was in the middle of winter at the time, and it wasn't as warm as we hoped. And Barber felt the cold in that meeting hall, and we only had the one meeting there. And afterwards, we moved across into the main house which we had built for Barber, which contains a room built within the house so that one day it can be taken out whole. So that Barber, when we were all gathered before Barber, and Barber would be seated on a chair just at the, the doorway of his room and we would be in the, in the main part of the house seated on forms in front of him or, 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 or seated on the floor. And there Barber, over those days, Barber gave us certain discourses which he had previously given here in America during his visit just before coming to Australia. Uh, we also again had ind uh, individual interviews with Barber. Uh, again, also, again, there was a, the time that I remember most vividly was a period, uh, some two hour session that Francis and I had with Barber, with Barber and the Mundley and us too, about work in Australia and about Avatar's abode. And that's the sort of session that I remember so vividly of Barber. <laughs> and it's the work sessions that I, that I associate so much with certain particular meetings with Barber. Barber would ask questions of what was happening in Australia, would listen to suggestions, agree. Uh, one, for example, it came up with regard to the formation of a trust, the ownership of Avatar's abode. And although Barber agreed, it was also obvious that, he, that it wasn't the time and nothing came of it. Although Barber you know, indicated, yes, yes, all right, do that. And yet one felt that it wasn't definite and, there, and, and it, 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 it was proved so because it never came about. It is only, in, only this year that I, that I have formed a trust. Um, Barber, right, so that we had, we had this session which would, would be concerned with the, with the work and the places in Australia. Uh, then we also had individual interviews, uh, singly or in families. And he and Barber gave a great deal of attention to two families who were with whom he uh, approved them staying on the property at Avatar's abode. They both expressed an interest in, in living there and uh, doing their best to establish farming, although they were, they'd had no previous experience in farming. Although Barber again was concerned and questioned them, obviously uh, going into detail, were they able to do it? How wholehearted were they? Did they realise what they were undertaking? Very... A very lovely times that uh, then with Barber. It was the times when one certainly remembers most. <laughs> um, although any time with Barber was lovely, <laughs> any time. But one one does tend to remember certain times over other times. There were times. There was a, the the time when we took Barber on a 
a somewhat of a tour of Avatar's abode. Doing their best to establish farming, although they were, they'd had no previous experience in farming, although Barber again was concerned and questioned them. Obviously, uh, going into detail, were they able to do it? How wholehearted were they? Did they realise what they were undertaking? Very, very lovely times that uh, then with Barber. It was the times when one certainly remembers most. <laughs> Um, although any time with Barbara was lovely, <laughs> any time, but one, one does tend to remember certain times over other times. There were times, there was a, the, the time when we took Barbara on a, a somewhat of a tour of Avatar's abode, and, and we, um, we showed him the farmhouse that was originally there and in which one of the families were then to live in, and then also the the uh, the tents that we had erected for the men. The women stayed in the farmhouse and the men stayed in tents that we put up just for that purpose. Uh, Barbara kept all the men and women separate? Well, yes, of course that was all that would naturally be so. Uh, the women The women all stayed together in the in one house, and the men all stayed in the uh, in the in these tents, these three big army tents which we had purchased and erected, especially for that at that time. No, Barber. This was after Barber's second accident, and uh, only only in the minor sense of walking through the house with him. Uh, walking around the tent site. Otherwise, he was taken in the car to those particular sites. He walked up and down. He seemed very happy. He spoke much about the future of Avatar's abode, which he confirmed again in 67, which he confirmed in so many messages he sent subsequently. He, he said how it would become a great spiritual center, how it would become a great place of pilgrimage, how many people would come. He didn't say how many, I mean in the sense that many people would come. Uh, he obviously was, was very happy there. I remember one occasion when he walked under the veranda to the edge of the house where one can see the ocean. One overlooks, one sees a, a, a quite an expanse of ocean and Barber was, had his hand on Francis's shoulder and then he played with Francis's ear like this, twigged it playfully and said how well Francis had chosen that property, how beautiful it was. One can see the ocean. One overlooks, one sees a, a, a quite an expanse of ocean and Barber was, had his hand on Francis's shoulder and then he played with Francis's ear like this, twigged it playfully and said how well Francis had chosen that property, how beautiful it was. I'm sorry, sorry you'll have to... I can't remember, I, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I've been with Barber in drinking I remember one time he asked at the airport in '56. He suddenly asked me for a, for a a, a drink, a, a fruit drink, I think it was, and I had to run all around the airport to try to find something open. At that time it was the evening, and and all I could get was ice cold, orange cordial type of thing. So I I had to think fast. How was I going to warm it up? So I filled the basin in the bathroom with hot water in the bathroom, one of the bathrooms at the airport and, and held the, the, uh, the cup of juice in the water to warm it and then took it to Barber and then Barber took one sip and handed the rest to me. So <laughs> at least I, for the labour that I had, I had a, a wonderful drink. Um, it, 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 Avatar's abode 
Barber and the Mundley ate in the barber house and we all ate uh, at the farmhouse. We all ate together. The women cooked for Barber, cooked meals and would be taken up to Barber. And so often Barber would only have a little bit of the food, say how, how fine it was, but then send the rest back to be shared amongst us. Uh, no, not that time, no. Barber didn't play any games. He played games with the, uh, as I said, with the children in 56. Marbles, ball games, uh, you know, sleight of hand, and, and uh, the kids loved it. They loved being with Barber. Now, I don't know of any child that, didn't, that doesn't respond or didn't respond so, so completely and wholeheartedly and immediately with Barber. Um, but not in 56. He was more serious. It was as though it was, as though he was saying to us, now you are more, you should be more grown up. Now we'll have a more adult period, time together. We can't, we can't always be like children and play. That was the, the sort of feeling that I got. Um, what else can I say of fifty of nineteen fifty eight? I, I hmm? yes, I yes, that's right. We went, we left uh, again. I was with Barber. We went back to Brisbane. We stayed again overnight, uh, and uh, we in the morning we departed for Sydney. We returned all together in Sydney, to Sydney, in the plane. And again, he came to Mayer House. 